Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Virtual Vertica VDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Vertica in Eon Mode at the Trade Desk. My name is Sue LeClaire, Director of Marketing at Vertica, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Joining me is Ron Cormier, Senior Vertica Database Engineer at the Trade Desk. Before we begin, I encourage you to submit qu questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, you can visit Vertica Forums to post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, a quick reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. So let's get started. Over to you, Ron. Thanks, Sue. Uh, I, I, before I get started, I'll just mention that uh, my, my slide template was created before social distancing was a thing, so uh, uh, hopefully some of the images will, will harken us back to a time when we, we could actually all be in the same room. Uh, <laughs> but um, with, with that, I, I want to get started. Uh, the, the, before I, I, we get started in talking about the technology, I just wanted to cover my background real quick because I think it, it, it speaks to uh, uh, where, where we're coming from with Vertica Eon at the Trade Desk. And uh, I'll, I'll start out just by pointing out that prior to my time at the Trade Desk, I was a tech consultant at HP, HP Vertica. And so I traveled the, the, the world uh, working with Vertica customers, helping them uh, configure, uh, install, tune, uh, set up their, their Vertica databases and, and get them working uh, properly. So I've seen the biggest and, and the smallest implementations and, and, and everything in between. Um, and, and so now I'm, I'm actually principal database engineer at, at the Trade Desk. And, and I, the reason I, I mention this is to, to let you know that I, I'm a practitioner. Uh, I'm working with, with the, the product every day or most days. This isn't, this isn't marketing material, so hopefully uh, the, the, the technical details in, in this presentation are, are helpful. I work uh, with Vertica, of course, and, and that is most relative or relevant to our ETL and reporting stack. And so what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of data into Vertica and running reports for our customers. And we're in ad tech, so I did want to just uh, briefly uh, describe what, what that means and how it, it affects our implementation. So I'm not going to cover the, the, all the details of this slide, but basically uh, I want to point out that the Trade Desk is a DSP, a, de a demand side provider. Um, and so we place ads on behalf of our customers or our agencies and ad agencies and their customers uh, that are advertisers, brands themselves. And the ads get placed on to uh, websites and, and, and mobile applications and anywhere, anywhere uh, digital advertising happens. Um, so uh, publishers are, are what we think of and like, the, like you see here, ESPN.com, MSN.com and so on. And so every time a user goes to one of these sites or, or, or one of these uh, digital places, um, uh, an, an auction takes place. And what people are bidding on is the, the privilege of showing an, an ad, one or more ads to, to users. And um, so this is, this is really important because it helps fund the internet. Um, ads can be annoying sometimes, but they actually help, help are incredibly helpful in how we get uh, much of much of our content and this is happening in real time uh, uh, at, at very high volumes so on the open internet there is anywhere from 7 to 13 million auctions happening every second um, 
of those 7 to 13 million auctions happening every second, the trade desk bids on hundreds of thousands per second. Um, so uh, that gives, and, and anytime we bid, uh, we have an event that ends up in Vertica. That's, that's uh, one of the main drivers of, of our data volume. And certainly other events make their way in, into Vertica as well. But um, uh, that wanted to give you a sense of, of the, the, the scale of the data and sort of how it's impacting or how um, it is impacted by sort of real, real people uh, in, in the world. So um, the, uh, let, let's, let's dig a little bit more in, into the workload. Um, and and uh, we have the three Vs uh, in spades, like, like many, many people listening do, uh, massive volume, velocity, and variety. Uh, in terms of the data sizes, uh, I've got some information here, some stats on, on the raw data sizes that, that, that we deal with on a, on a daily basis per day. So we ingest 85 terabytes of, of raw data per day. And then uh, once we get it into Vertica, uh, we do some transformations. We do matching, uh, which is like joins, basically. And we do some aggregation, group buys, to uh, reduce the data and, and make it, clean it up, make it so uh, it, it's more efficient to consume by our reporting layer. So that matching and aggregation uh, produces about 10 new terabytes of, of raw data per day. And it all comes from the uh, it all comes from the, the data that was ingested, but it's it's new data, and um, so that's so it, it is reduced quite a bit, but um, it's still uh, pretty pretty high high volume. And so we have this uh, aggregated data that uh, we then run reports on 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 behalf of our customers. Uh, so we have about 40,000 reports per day. Um, that's probably that's actually a little bit old an older number. It's probably closer to 50 or 55,000 uh, reports per day at this point. So it's um, per, I think probably a pretty common uh, use case uh, for for Vertica customers. It's a, maybe a little different in the sense that most of the reports themselves are batch reports, so they're not uh, it's not a user uh, sitting at a keyboard waiting for the result. Um, basically, we have we we have a, a workflow where we, we we do the ingest, we do the transform, and then and then uh, once once all the data is available for uh, a day, we, we run reports on behalf of our customer to on behalf of our customers uh, on that that daily data, and then we send the reports out um, via email or, or we drop them in a shared location, and then they they look at the reports uh, at, 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 at some later point of time. So um, it, up until Eon, uh, we, we did all this work on, on Enterprise Vertica. At our peak, we had uh, four production enterprise clusters, each which held two petabytes of, of raw data. And uh, I'll, I'll give you some details on, on how those uh, enterprise clusters were, were configured in the hardware. But um, before I do that, I, I want to talk about the reporting workload specifically. So the, the reporting workload is, is uh, particularly lumpy. And um, what I mean by that is uh, there's, there's a bunch of work that becomes available, a bunch of queries that we need to run in a short period of time uh, after, after the day's uh, ingest and aggregation is, is completed. And then uh, the clusters are relatively quiet for the remaining portion of the day. Um, that's not to say they are, they're not doing anything uh, as far as read workload, but they certainly are, but it's much uh, less uh, read activity um, after that big spike. So what I'm showing here is our reporting queue and uh, the, the spike is, is, is when um, all those reports become a bit sort of available to be processed. We can't, we can't process, we can't run the reports until we've done the full ingest and matching and aggregation for the day. And so right around uh, 1 or 2 a.m. UTC time every day, that's when we get the spike. And the uh, spike, we, we, we affectionately call it the UTC hump. But uh, basically, it's, it's a huge number of queries that uh, need to be processed sort of as soon as possible. And, and we have service levels that, that, that dictate what as soon as possible means. But um, 
I think the spike illustrates uh, our, our use case pretty pretty accurately, and um, it, it really, um, as, as we'll see, it, it's really uh, well suited for for Vertic Eon, and and uh, we'll, we'll see what that means. So we've got our uh, we had our enterprise clusters uh, that I mentioned earlier, and and just to give you some some details on what they look like, they. Uh, they were uh, independent and mirrored. And so what that means is all four clusters held the same data. Um, and we did this uh, in intentionally because we wanted to be able to run our reports anywhere. Uh, we, so, so we've got this big queue of reports, this big uh, number of reports that need to be run. And, and we've got these, we started, we started with one cluster and then we, got, we found that it couldn't keep up. So we added a second and, and we, we found the number of reports went up that we needed to run in that short period of time and and so on so we we end, eventually ended up with four enterprise clusters basically with this with the same uh data and so we'd say they were mirrored they all had the same data they weren't uh however synchronized they were independent and so basically we would run the 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 etl pipeline so to speak we would run the ingest and the matching and the aggregation on all the clusters in parallel so they, it wasn't as if each cluster proceeded to the next step in sync with, with, with the other clusters. Um, they, were, they were run independently. So it was sort of like each, each cluster would eventually uh, get, get consistent. Um, and so this, this worked pretty well uh, for, for us, um, but uh, the, it created some imbalances and there were some cost uh, concerns uh, that, that, that we'll dig into. But uh, just to tell you about each of these, each of these clusters, uh, they each had 50 nodes. They had uh, 72 logical CPU cores, uh, half, a half a terabyte of RAM, a bunch of uh, RAID, rated uh, disk drives, and um, two petabytes of, of, of raw data, as, as I stated before. Um, so pretty big. Uh, beefy nodes that are physical physical nodes that that we held we had in our data centers. We actually leased these nodes, um, so so it was on our data center providers' um, uh, uh, data centers, and um, the, these were uh, these these were what we built our business on basically. But there was a number of challenges that uh, we, we ran into as we as we continued to build our business and, and add data and add uh, workload, and and the first one is is something that I'm sure many can relate to is capacity planning. So we had to uh, think about the future and try to predict the amount of work that was going to need to be done and how much hardware we were going to need to satisfy that work to to, to meet that demand. And um, that's that's just uh, generally a, a hard thing to do. Um, it, it's very difficult to predict the future, as we can probably all attest to, uh, and how much the world has changed, and even in the last month. Um, so uh, it, it's a it's a very difficult thing to do to look six, uh, 12, 18, 18 months in, into the future and and sort of get it right. And 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 what people what we tended to do is we we tried, we tried to uh, our, our plans our estimates were very conservative so we overbought in, in in a lot of cases and 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 not only that we had to plan for the peak so we're planning uh for that 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 point in time that those those, those number of hours in the early morning when we had to when we had all those reports to run and so that was so so we ended up buying uh, a lot of hardware, and um, we we actually uh, uh, sort of o overbought at, at times. And then and then as the hardware would age, it would kind of come into um, it, it, it would come into maturity, and we have our our our, our workload uh, would sort of come approach matching uh, the the demand. So that was one of the big challenges. The next uh, challenge is that we were uh, running out of disk. Um, we can't. Uh, we we wanted to uh, add data uh, in in sort of two dimensions. The, the only the, the dimensions that everybody can think about. We wanted to add more columns to our big aggregates, and we wanted to keep our big aggregates for for longer periods of time. So 
um, both horizontally and vertically. We we, we wanted to uh, expand the, the, the data sets, but we, we basically were running out of disk. There was no more disk, and and it's it's hard to add uh, disk to uh, Vertica in, in enterprise mode. Um, not not impossible, but uh, certainly hard. And and one cannot uh, add disk. Uh, without adding compute, because enterprise mode, uh, uh, um, the, the disk is all local to each of the nodes. For for most most people, you can do exotic things with SANs and, and other external arrays, but that's uh, there are a number of other challenges with that. So um, adding in order to add disk, we had to add compute, and um, that basically meant uh, kept us out of balance. We were adding more compute than than we needed for for the amount of disk. So um, that was the problem. Certainly, physical nodes, getting them the ordered, delivered, uh, racked, cabled, um, even before we even start touch Vertica, there's lead times there. And, um, and, and so, uh, and also long commitments since, since we, like I mentioned, we lease our hardware. So we were committing to these uh, nodes, these, these, these physical servers for two or three years at a time. And, and as, as I mentioned, it, that's, that can be a hard thing to do, but we wanted the lease to, to, to keep our uh, CapEx down. Um, so we wanted to keep our aggregates for a long period of time. We could have done crazy things uh, or, or more exotic things to, uh, to, to help us with this if, if we had to in enterprise mode. We could have started to like daisy chain clusters together and uh, that would have been uh, sort of a non-trivial engineering effort because we would need to then figure out how to migrate data. So first we would shard the data across all the clusters and then we would have to migrate data from one cluster to another cluster as it ages. And we would have to think about um, how to aggregate or run queries across clusters. So if, you, if your data set spans two clusters, we would have had to sort of aggregate it within each cluster maybe, and then uh, build something on top that aggregated the data from each of those clusters. So uh, not impossible things, but certainly not easy things. And um, luckily for us, uh, we started talking about to Vertica about um, separation of compute and storage. And, and I know other customers were talking to Vertica as we were, because um, lots of people had, had these problems. And so, Vertica in Eon mode uh, came to the rescue. And uh, what I want to do is just talk about Eon mode uh, really briefly for, for those in the audience who aren't familiar. But it's basically Vertica's answer to the separation of compute and storage. It allows one to scale compute uh, and or storage separately. Um, and and this, 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 there's a number of uh, advantages to doing that. Um, whereas in the old enterprise days, when you added compute, you added storage and vice versa. Now we can now we can add one or the other or both uh, according to how we want to. And so, really briefly, how this works. This slide, this this figure was taken directly from the Vertica documentation. Um, and so just to just to talk really briefly about how it works, it, it, it's taking advantage of the cloud. And so in this case, uh, Amazon Web Services, the elasticity in, in the cloud. And basically, we've got uh, EC2 instances, uh, so Elastic Cloud Compute servers, um, that access data that's in an S3 bucket. And so three, three uh, EC2 nodes and, and a bucket are the, the blue objects in, in this diagram. And um, the difference is or a couple of couple of big differences. One, uh, the data no longer the persistent storage of the data. The data the, where the data lives no, is no longer on each of the nodes. The the persistent storage of the data is in the S3 bucket. And so um, what that does is it uh, basically solves one of our first big problems, which is we were running out of disk. Um, the uh, S3 has, uh, for all in intents and purposes, uh, infinite storage. Um, so we could keep much more data there, and, um, and uh, that, that mostly solved uh, one, one of our big problems. So the persistent data lives on uh, S3. Now, what happens is when a query runs, uh, it, it, it runs on one of the three nodes that you see here. 
And uh, it, it, assuming, uh, we'll talk about Depot in a second, but what happens in a brand new cluster where uh, uh, it's just, we just spun up the hardware is uh, the query will, will run on those EC2 nodes, but there'll be no data. So those nodes will reach out to S3 and run the query on remote storage. Um, so the, so the, query, the, the nodes are literally reaching out to the communal storage for, for the data and processing it entirely um, without using any data on, on the nodes themselves. And um, so that, that, that works pretty well. Um, it, it's not as fast as if the data was local to the nodes, but um, what Vertica did is they built a caching layer uh, on, on each of the nodes, and that's what the depot represents. So the depot is some amount of uh, disk that is relatively local to the EC2 node. And so uh, when the query runs on ro remote storage on the, on the S3 data, it then queues up the data for download to, to the nodes. And, and uh, so the, the data will, get, will, will reside in the depot so that the next query or the subsequent, qu subsequent queries can run on local storage instead of uh, remote storage. And, and, and that speeds things up uh, quite a bit. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's what the, the role of the depot is. The depot is, is basically a caching layer, and we'll talk about the details of, of how we configured our, our, our depot. The other thing that I want to point out is that uh, since uh, this is the, the, the cloud, um, another problem uh, that, that that helps us solve is the concurrency problem. So. Uh, you can imagine that these three nodes are one sort of cluster, and what we can do is we can spin up another three nodes and have it point to the same S3 communal storage bucket. So now we've got six nodes pointing to the same data, but we've 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 uh, isolated each of the three nodes uh, so that they uh, act as if they are their own cluster. And so Vertica calls them subclusters. So we've got two subclusters, each of which has three nodes. And what this has essentially done, it has had doubled the concurrency, doubled the number of queries that can run at any given time, um, because we've now got this new uh, place, uh, which uh, this new uh, chunk of compute, which which can answer queries. And so that has given us the ability to add concurrency much faster. And uh, I'll point out that uh, for since since it's cloud and 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 uh, there are on-demand pricing models, we we can have uh, significant savings because when uh, a, a subcluster is not needed, we can stop it and we pay almost almost nothing for it. Um, so uh, that's that's really really important, and really helpful, especially for our workload, which I pointed out for, before was so lumpy. So those hours of the day when it's relatively quiet, I can go and stop a bunch of subclusters and, uh, and, and I won't pay for them. So that, that yields um, nice cost savings. So that's Eon in, in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, engineers and, and the documentation can give a, a lot more information, and I'm happy to field questions later on as well. But uh, I, I want to talk about how how we implemented Eon at, at, at the trade desk. And so um, I'll start on the left hand side at the top. Uh, the, the the what we're representing here is subclusters. So there's subcluster zero, our ETL subcluster, and it is a our primary subcluster. So when when you get into the world of Eon, there's primary subclusters and secondary subclusters, and and um, it has to do with quorum. So primary subclusters are the subclusters that that we always expect to be up and running, and they they contribute to quorum. They decide whether there's enough instances, n number of uh, a, a number of enough nodes to have the database start up, and so. These, this is where we run our ETL workload, which is the ingest, the match, and the aggregate part of, of the work that, that I talked about earlier. So uh, these nodes are always up and running because our ETL pipeline is always on. We're, we're an internet ad tech company, like I mentioned, and so we're constantly getting, constantly running ads, and there's always data flowing into the system, and the matching is happening in the aggregation. Um, so that part happens 24-7. And uh, we wanted so that those nodes will always be up and running. 
and uh, we need this we need that those processes to be uh, super efficient and so what that is reflected in our instance type so each of our subclusters is 64 nodes I'll talk about how we came at that number but um, the instance type for the ETL subcluster uh, the primary subcluster is i3 8x large so uh, that is uh, one of the instance types that uh, has uh, quite a bit of NVMe stores attached. Um, and we'll talk about that. But um, 32 cores, 244 gigs of RAM on, on, on each node. And, um, and uh, that, what that allows us to do, uh, I should have put the amount of NVMe, but I think it's 7 terabytes uh for nvme storage well, what that allows us to do is to basically ensure that our etl everything that this subcluster does is always in depot and uh so that that makes sure that, that it's always fast now when we get to the secondary subclusters these are as mentioned secondary so they can stop and start and um it, it won't affect the cluster going up or down um so they they are sort of independent and we've got uh four well, what we call read subclusters. Um, and, and they're not uh, read by definition, uh, or technically they're not read only. Um, any any subcluster can uh, in, ingest and, and create new data within the database and that'll all get, uh, that'll all get pushed to the S3 bucket. But um, logically for us, they're read only. Like these, we just, most of the, the work that they happen to do is, is read only. Um, which is which is nice because if it's read only, it doesn't need to worry about commits, and um, we let we let the primary subcluster, our ETL subcluster, worry about committing data, and, and we don't have to we don't have to have the all nodes in the database participating in, in transaction commits. So we've got uh, four uh, uh, read subclusters, and we've got one ETL subcluster, so uh, a, a total of five subclusters, each subcluster running. 64 nodes, so that gives us a 320 node database, uh, all, all things uh, counted. And not all of those nodes are up at the same time, as I mentioned, but um, often, often for big chunks of the day, most of the read nodes are down, but uh, they, they do all spin up during our, uh, during our busy time. So for the read subclusters, we've got i3 4x cells. So again, the i3 instance family type, uh, which has NVMe stores. These nodes have, I think, three and a half terabytes of uh, NVMe per, per node. Uh, we just rate it. We, there's, there's two NVMe drives, and we RAID zero them together. Um, and 16 cores, 122 gigs of RAM. So these are smaller, uh, as you'll notice, but it, it works out well for us because the the read workload is is typically dealing with much smaller data sets than than the the ingest or the aggregation workload. Um, so we can we can run uh, these workloads on on smaller instances and, uh, and and save a little bit of money and get more granularity with how many. Uh, subclusters are stopped and started at any given time. The NVMe uh, doesn't persist, uh, the, the data on it isn't persisted via stop and start, um, which is an important uh, detail, but um, it's okay because the depot does a pretty good job in, 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 that, in that algorithm where it, 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 it pulls data in that's recently used and the data that gets pushed out evicted uh is is the data that's least recently used so it was used a long time ago so it's probably not going to be used again so we've got um uh five subclusters and we've actually got two two of those so we've got um a, a, a 320 node cluster in us east and a 320 node cluster in us west so we've got high availability region diversity so the, and, and their peers like i talked about before they're they're independent uh but but mirrors um, they are each run 128 shards, and and so uh, what that what that what shards are is basically the, it's, it's similar to segmentation, but you take the data set and you divide it uh, into into chunks, and though and each subcluster can can see one the data set in its entirety, and so each subcluster is dealing with 128 shards, and we chose 128 because it'll give us even distribution of the data on 64 node subclusters. Uh, 
sixty one hundred twenty eight divides evenly uh, by sixty four, and uh, so there so there is no data skew, and and we chose one hundred twenty eight because uh, to to sort of future proof uh, in case we wanted to double the size of any of the clusters, we can double the number of nodes, and we'd still have uh, no skew. The data would be distributed evenly. Uh, the disk, uh, what we've done is, uh, so we've got a couple of RAID uh, um, arrays. We've got an EBS-based array that the catalog uses, so the catalog stores location, and I think we take four uh, four EBS volumes and RAID zero them together and um, come up with a 128 uh, uh, gigabyte drive. And, and we wanted EBS for the catalog because it, uh, we can stop and start nodes, and that data will persist. Um, it will come back when, when the node comes up, so we don't have to run a bunch of configuration uh, when, when the node starts up. Basically, the node starts, it automatically joins the cluster, and, and very shortly thereafter, it starts processing work. So that's catalog and EBS. Now, the NVMe is, is another RAID 0. Um, as I mentioned, this data is ephemeral, so when we stop and start, it goes away. But um, basically, we take uh, 512 gigabytes of the NVMe, and we, we give it to the data temp storage location. And then we take whatever is remaining and give it to the depot. And, and since the ETL and the read clusters are different instance types, they, uh, the, the depot is, is sized differently. But otherwise, it's, it's the same across all clusters. Well, so it all adds up. What, what we have is uh, now. We, uh, we stopped the purging data for some of our big aggregates. We added a bunch more columns. And what basically, we, at this point, we have eight petabytes of, of raw data in, in each Eon cluster. And it is uh, obviously about four times uh, what, what we can hold in our, in our enterprise clusters. And we can continue to add to this. Um, it, maybe we need to add compute. Maybe we don't. But the, the, the amount of data that can that can be held there can can obviously grow uh, much more. We've also built an auto scaling tool or service uh, that basically monitors the queue that I showed you earlier. Monitors for those spikes, and when it sees those spikes, it uh, then goes and starts up instances in, 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 in uh, one subcluster in, in, in any of the subclusters. So uh, that's that's how uh, that's how we we have compute match. Uh, the capacity match the, match the demand. I'll also point out that we actually have uh, one subcluster is, is of specialized nodes. It doesn't actually, it's not strictly a customer reports uh, subcluster. So we had this, uh, this tool called Planner, which uh, basically optimizes ad campaigns for, for our customers. And uh, we built it. It runs on Vertica, uses data in Vertica, runs Vertica queries, and um, it was uh, it, it was wildly successful. Um, so uh, we wanted to have uh, some dedicated compute for it. And Eon, with Eon, it made it really easy to basically spin up one of these subclusters or a new subcluster and say, here you go, planner team, do what you want. You can, you can completely maximize the, these, the resources on these nodes. And uh, it won't affect any of the other operations that, that we're doing, the, the ingest, the matching, the aggregation, or the reports. Um, so it gave us uh, a, a great deal of flexibility and agility, which um, is, is super helpful. So the question is, has it been worth it? And uh, for us, the, the answer has been a resounding yes. We're doing things that we never could have done at, at reasonable cost before. And uh, we've got more data, we've got specialized nodes, and, and we're, we're much more agile. So how to quantify that? Um, well, it's, it's, it's not quite uh, as simple and straightforward as, as you might hope. I mean, we still have enterprise clusters. We've got two of the, the, the four that we had at peak. So we still got two of those around, and we've got our two Eon clusters. But they are running uh, different workloads, and they're comprised of entirely different hardware. The, 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 as as I've, I've covered, the, the number of nodes is different per subcluster. So 64 versus 50 is going to have different performance. Uh, the, the workload itself, the aggregation is uh, aggregating more columns on Eon uh, because that's where we have disk available. 
The queries themselves are different. They're, they're running more uh, more queries on more intensive data intensive queries on Eon because that's where the data is available. So in a sense, it is Eon is doing the heavy lifting uh, for for the cluster uh, for for our workload. In terms of query performance, uh, still a little anecdotal, but like when w the the queries that run on the enterprise cluster. Uh, uh, the performance matches that of the enterprise cluster quite closely when uh, the data is in the depot. When the data is not in the depot and Vertica has to go out to S3 to uh, to get the data, uh, performance degrades, as, as you might expect. Um, it can, it, it, but it depends on the query itself. Things like counts, count star is really fast, but if you need lots of the data from to materialize, materialize lots of columns. Um, that, that can run slower, um, not orders of magnitude slower, but certainly multiple uh, of, of the amount of time. In terms of cost, uh, anecdotal, well, let's get a little bit more uh, quantify it here. Um, so what I tried to do is I tried to figure out, uh, multiply it out. If I wanted to run the entire workload on enterprise and I wanted to run the entire workload on Eon with all the data that we have today, all the queries, uh, everything, and to try to get it to be apples to apples. So for enterprise, the the I, I'd estimate that we would need approximately 18,000 cores, CPU cores altogether, and um, that's a big number. But that doesn't even cover all the non-trivial engineering work that would need to be required that I kind of referenced earlier. Things like sharding the data among multiple clusters, migrating the data from one cluster to another, the daisy chain type stuff. Um, so that's that's a data point. Now for Eon to run the entire workload, uh, I, I estimate we'd need about 20,480 CPU cores. So more CPU cores uh, than than uh, enterprise. However, about half of those, 10 approximately 10,000 of those CPU cores would only run for about six hours per day. And so uh, with the on-demand and elasticity of the cloud, that uh, that is uh, a, a, a huge advantage. And so we are uh, definitely moving uh, as fast as we can to being on all Eon. Um, we have we have time left on our contracts with the enterprise clusters. We're not uh, we're not able to get rid of them quite yet, but uh, e Eon is certainly the way of uh, of the future for us. I also want to point out that. Uh, I mean, Eon is, is I've, we found to be the most efficient MPP database on the market. And what that refers to is uh, for a given dollar of, of, of spend of cost, uh, we get the most from that dollar. We get the most out of Vertica uh, for that dollar compared to other uh, cloud and MPP database platforms. Um, so our, our business is, is really happy. Uh, with, with what we've been able to deliver uh, with Eon. Eon has also given us the ability to uh, begin a new use case, uh, which is probably, uh, this use case is probably pretty familiar to, to folks on the call where it's uh, UI based. So we'll have uh, a website that our customers can log into and they, from that website, they'll be able to uh, run reports, run queries, uh, through the website and have that run uh, directly on uh, a separate Vertica Eon cluster. And so uh, much more latent, latency sensitive and concurrency sensitive. So uh, the, the, the workload that I've described up until this point has been pretty steady throughout the day and then we get our spike and then, and then it goes back to normal for the rest of the day. This workload it will be uh, potentially more variable. We don't know exactly when our, our our engineers are going to deliver some huge feature that is going to make a lot of, uh, make a lot of people want to log into the website and check how their campaigns are doing. So uh, we, uh, but Eon really helps us with this because we can add capacity so easily. We can add compute, and uh, we can uh, add uh, so we can scale that up and down as needed. And uh, it allows us to match the concurrency. So. Uh, Eon, um, the concurrency is can be much more variable. We don't need the big long lead times, um, so we're, we're we're really excited about about this. 
So uh, the last slide here, I just want to leave you with some things to think about if you're about to embark or getting started on your, your journey with, with Vertica Eon. Uh, one of the things that you'll have to think about is the node count and the shard count. So uh, they're, they're kind of tightly coupled. The, the node count we determine by figuring, by, by spinning up some instances um, in a single subcluster and getting performance similar to uh, 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 finding an acceptable performance uh, considering current workload, future workload for uh, the queries that we had uh, when we started. And so we went with 64. Uh, we wanted to, we wanted to, certainly wanted to increase over 50, uh, but we didn't want to have them be too big because, of course, it costs money. Um, and so, uh, in, plus, we like to do things in, in power of two. So uh, 64 nodes. And then the shard count, um, so the shards, again, is like the data segmentation, is a this new type of segmentation on the data. And the shard count, we went with 128. And again, the reason is so that uh, we could have uh, no skew. Right? Each node could process the uh, same, same amount of data. And uh, we wanted to future proof it. So uh, that, that's probably, that's probably a, a nice general recommendation, um, double, double the shard count for, for the nodes. The instance type and, and how much depot space, those are certainly things you're going to have to consider. Like, like I was talking about, we went for the i3, 4XL, i3, 8XL because they offer uh, good, good depot storage, which gives us uh, really consistent good performance when, when it is all in depot. Um, the very good documentation has some information on, on uh, I think we're going to use the R, the R5 or the R4 instance types for our for our UI cluster, so much less the data smaller, so much less emphasis on depots, so we don't need all that NVMe storage. Um, we're probably going to want to have a reserve, a mix of reserved and on-demand instances uh, if you're if you're a 24/7 shop like we are. Like so, our ETL subclusters, those are reserved instances because we know we're going to run those 24 hours a day. Uh, 365 days a year, so uh, there's, there's no advantage of having them be on demand. On demand costs more than reserved, so uh, we get cost savings on on um, figuring out what we're going to run uh, uh, and, and have and keep running. Um, and it's the the read subclusters that are for the most part on on demand. Uh, we have one of our read subclusters is is actually on 24/7 because we keep it up for ad hoc queries your analyst queries that, that uh, we don't know when exactly they're going to hit and they want to be able to continue working uh, whenever they want to. In terms of uh, the initial data load, uh, the initial data ingest, um, what, what we had to do, and I, I imagine how it works to, to, up till today, is uh, you've got to basically load all your data uh, from scratch. Um, there isn't uh, great tooling just yet for uh, data populate or moving from enterprise to EON. So uh, what we did is we exported all the data in our enterprise cluster into Parquet files on, and put those out on S3, and then we ingested them uh, in, in, into, into our first Eon cluster. Um, so it was kind of a pain. Uh, we scripted out a bunch of stuff, obviously, but um, we, it, it, it worked. Um, and the good news is that once you do that, like the second Eon cluster is just a bucket copy, and, and, and so there's, there's uh, tools that can that can help uh, help with that. Uh, you're going to want to manage uh, your fetches and evictions. So this is the data that's in the cache, is what I'm referring to here. The data that's in the depot. And so, uh, like I talked about, we have our ETL cluster, which has the most recent data that's just been ingested and the most recent data that's been aggregated. So this really recent data. So we wouldn't want anybody logging into that ETL cluster and running queries on big aggregates that go back month or years. Um, because that would invalidate the cache. The, the, the depot would start pulling in that historical data and it would start it, or, or fetching that historical data and evicting the recent data, which would slow things down, slow down that ETL pipeline. So, so we didn't want that. So we need to make sure that users, whether they're service accounts or human users, are connecting to the right subcluster. And um, I mean, we just created the United Centuries with IPs and target groups. Um, so it's, uh, Pretty, pretty easy, but definitely something to think about. Lastly, if you're like us and you're going to want to stop and start nodes, you're going to have to have a service that uh, that, that does that for you. Um, we're, we're, we 
we, we built this uh, very uh, simple tool that basically monitors the queue and stops and starts subclusters accordingly. We're hoping that, that we can uh, work with Vertica to uh, have it be a little bit more driven by the cloud configuration itself. So, so for us, it's all Amazon, and, and uh, we, we'd love it if we could uh, uh, have it have it uh, scale with the with the uh, with with the AWS config. Two points, uh, two things to watch out for uh, when when you're working with Eon is uh, the first is system table queries on uh, storage layer metadata, and uh, the thing to be careful of is that the storage layer metadata is replicated. There's a copy for each of the subclusters that are out there. So like we have the ETL subcluster and our read subcluster. So for each of the five subclusters, there is a copy of all the data in storage containers system table, all the data in partitions system table. So when you want to use this, these system tables for analyzing how much data you have or, or, or any other analysis, um, make sure that you filter your query with uh, node name. And so for us, the node name is less than or equal to 64 because our, each of our subclusters are 64. So we limit we limit the nodes to the to the 64 ET 64 node ETL cluster. Otherwise, if we didn't have this filter, we would get 5x the the values for counts and sub and that sort of stuff. And lastly, there is a, a problem that we're kind of uh, working on and thinking about is uh, DC table data for. Uh, subclusters that are uh, are stopped. When 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 the instance is stopped, literally the operating system is down and, and there's no way to access it. So it takes the DC table DC table data with it. And so I cannot after after my subclusters scale up in the morning and then they scale down. I can't run DC table queries on how what performed well and where and, and that sort of stuff because it, it, it's local to those nodes. So uh, we're working on something, so something to be aware of, and, and we're working on uh, a solution or an implementation to try to suck that data out of all the nodes, even, even those read-only nodes that stop and start all the time, and bring it into some other kind of repository, perhaps another vertical cluster, so that we can run analysis and monitoring uh, even, even when those nodes are down. That's it. Um, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to my presentation. Really enjoy it. Um, thank you, Ron. That uh, was a tremendous amount of information. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. Um, we have uh, some questions come in that I would like to present to you, Ron, if, if you have a couple more minutes. Um, yep. The first, let's Sounds jump great. right in. The first one, uh, loading 85 terabytes uh, per day of data is a pretty significant amount. What format does that data come in? And what does that load process look like? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, the format is uh, tab-separated files that are gzip compressed. And uh, the, the, the reason for that is basically historical. Um, uh, we don't have much tabs in our data. And uh, this is uh, how, how the data uh, gets uh, compressed and moved off of our, our bidders, the, the things that generate most of this data. Um, so uh, it's uh, it, PSV, TZIP compressed, and how we kind of we, we kind of have how we load it. You know, I would say we have actually kind of the Cadillac <laughs> loader uh, in, in a couple of different uh, perspectives. One is um, we've got this orchestration layer that's homegrown that, that, that manages uh, the logs, the, the data that gets loaded into Vertica. And so we, we, we accumulate data, and then uh, we, take, we take some some files, and we push them to, we distribute them among the ETL nodes in the, in, in the subcluster. And uh, so we're literally pushing the files to, to the nodes. And uh, we then run a copy statement to, to ingest the data in the database, and then we, we remove the files from, from the nodes themselves. And so it's a little bit extra data movement, uh, which uh, we, we may think about changing in the future, especially when we move more and more to Eon. But the really nice thing about this, especially for, for the enterprise clusters, is that the copy statements are, are really fast. And so we, the copy statements use uh, memory, like any other query. but um, the performance of the copy statement is really sensitive to the amount of available memory. And so 
uh, the, the, since the data is local to the nodes, literally in the data directory uh, that, that I referenced earlier, um, it can access that data from the NVMe storage and the copy statement runs very fast and then that memory is available to do something else. And so uh, we pay a little bit of a cost in terms of latency and in terms of downloading the data to the nodes. Um, and we might, uh, as, as we move more and more to, to Eon, we might uh, start ingesting it directly from S3, not copying it to the nodes first. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that, but yeah, that's how, that's how we, we, the data ingestion works. Great, thanks, Juan. Um, another question, what was the biggest challenge you found when migrating from on-prem to AWS? Uh, yeah, so um, a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, the first was the, the backfill and the data load. It, it was kind of a pain. I, I mean, like, like I referenced in, in that last slide. Um, only, only because, I mean, we didn't have tools to build to do this, so we, I mean, we had to script some stuff out, and, and it wasn't overly complex, but we had, it's just a lot of data to move. I mean, even with, starting with, with two petabytes, um, so uh, making sure that uh, there, there is no missed data, no gaps, uh, making and, and moving it from the enterprise cluster, so, so what we did is we exported it to, to the local disk on the enterprise clusters, then we, then we pushed it to S3, and then uh, we, we ingested it in, in, into Eon. Uh, again, all is parquet. Um, so it's a lot of data to move around, and I mean, we have to we have to take an outage at some point and stop loading data while we do that final catch up phase. And, and so that was that was a challenge, um, uh, sort of a one time challenge. The other thing that I mean, we've we've been dealing with, uh, or we've not that we're dealing with, but that was a challenge was. Um, is I mean it's a relatively even still it's a relatively new product for Vertica and so we our big uh, advantages of Eon is allow us to stop and start nodes and and recently uh, Vertica has gotten quite good at stopping and start starting nodes um, for a while there it was it was uh, it took a really long time to start the node back up and, and it could be invasive but uh, we worked with with the engineering team with with Yanzi and others. Uh, to really, really reduce that, and now it's not really an issue that we think that we think too much about. Okay, thanks. Um, towards the end of the presentation, you had said that you've got 128 shards, but you have mm -hmm. your subclusters are usually around 64 nodes, and you had talked about a ratio of uh, two to one. Yep. Um, why is that? And if you were to do it again, would you use 128 shards? Uh, good question. Um, so, uh, as, I, as I referenced, the reason why is because we wanted to feature proof ourselves. So basically, um, we, we wanted to make sure that the, the, the number of shards was evenly divisible by the number of nodes. And uh, you could, I could have done that with 64, I could have done that with, with, with 128 or any other multiple of 64. But we went with 128 to try to protect ourselves in the future so that if we wanted to double the number of nodes in, in the ETL subcluster specifically, uh, we could have done that. So that would have doubled from 64 to 128, and then each node would have had just one shard that it had, would have to deal with. So, so no skew. Um, the, the second part of the question, if I, had to do it, if I had to do it over again, I think I would have done, I think I would have stuck with 128. Um, we still have, I mean, so we've been running this cluster for more than 18 months now, I think especially in US East. And uh, we haven't needed to increase the number of nodes. Um, so in that sense, like it's been a little bit extra overhead having more shards, but um, it, it gives us the peace of mind that uh, we can easily double that and not have to worry about it. So I think I think two to one is a nice place to start, and you may even consider three to one or four to one uh, if if you're if you're expecting really rapid growth, if you were just getting started with Eon in your business and your data sets are small now, but we're, you expect to have them grow significantly going going forward. Great, thank you, Ron. Um, that's the, all the questions that we have out there for today. If you do have uh, others, please feel free to send them in, and we will get back to you, um, and we'll respond directly. Uh, via email, and again, our engineers will be available on the Vertica forums um, where you can continue the discussion with them um, there. 
Um, I want to thank uh, Ron for the great presentation and also the audience for uh, your participation and questions. Um, please note that a replay of today's event and a copy of the slides will be available on demand shortly. And of course, we invite you to share this information with your colleagues as well. Again, thank you. And this concludes this webinar and uh, have a great day.